Hi, uh, this is Fahmid al a visiting professor from Bard College, New York. And I invite you all to this conversation. Uh, it, this is a uh, one episode of the series conversation titled as Media, Culture and Human Rights. Um, uh, today, we are having our guest, uh, who is Professor Jakir Hussain Raju. Dr. Jakir Hussain Raju is a uh, professor at Independent, Independent University, Bangladesh, and author of the book, Cinema and National Identity of Bangladesh in Search of the Modern. Uh, moving from South Asian cinema, Dr. Raju developed further research in East Asian film and media. He was Korean Foundation Fellow at Korean National University of Arts in 2014 and Japan Foundation Fellow at Waseda University, Tokyo this year. More recently, he became the director of the King Sejong Institute, Dhaka, which is devoted to learning and teaching in Korean language and culture. I welcome Professor Raju uh, here in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fahmin. Okay. Um, today, uh, we'll be discussing on contemporary Korean cinema. And as we know that uh, after Parasite, Korean cinema has been uh, a sensation in world cinema. But as film buffs and film scholars, both of us, we are from the same background from Bangladesh. Uh, we have been watching uh, closely this Korean cinema uh, or the works of Korean cinema masters uh, at least for one and a half decades. So uh, today we'll be focusing on the contemporary Korean cinema practices. Uh, I start with the question, uh, how do you put Korean cinema in the contemporary world cinema? Dr. Raju. Thank you. Um, to speak about uh, Korean cinema in contemporary world cinema, I think uh, as you have given the example of Parasite, of course, after Parasite, uh, Korean cinema has been known to wider world in a like bigger way. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, if we look back in at least last 10, 20 years, I would say, Korean cinema, uh, especially films by uh, famous directors like Kim Ki-duk, uh, Park chan uh, and Bong Joon-ho, and I, I would uh, include Im Kon-tek, uh, who is another uh, senior Korean filmmaker. Their films uh, have been uh, shown in all the leading you know, global film festivals, including Cannes, Berlin, Venice, all these you know, uh, most prestigious film festivals, and also won uh, good number of important awards. Mm -hmm. So uh, Korean uh, contemporary cinema has been, uh, in a way, uh, I should say, has been a film festival favorite. Mm -hmm. for last uh, 15 years or so at least and uh, this is a very um, very phenomenal for a national cinema mm. from asia mm. to actually rule over uh, most of the major international film festivals for uh, more than 10 years i would say so th this is very uh, heartening for us as uh, asian cinema researcher yeah and and uh... Uh, say Japanese cinema, they have been uh, doing great works since uh, mid 50s, 1950s, and uh, in 1960s, new uh, Japanese cinema. And even today, uh, Japanese anime is very popular in the world. Their horror tradition is great. But uh, we have been seeing that Korean cinema, they have their own genre, right? Psychological thriller, thriller or something like that. Uh, over time, I think uh, their directors, uh, we, we, we need to talk about uh, their important directors. I mean, we, we already mentioned yeah, a few yeah. names, yeah. but we'll go into pro hopefully a bit deeper. And uh, we will see that each director developed his own kind of, you know, style and genre. Mm -hmm. Going beyond, say, uh, conventional genre understanding. Yeah. So my next question is, uh, this proliferation of Korean cinema in the world stays uh, how, mm -hmm. how, how do you see it? Uh, we have to look back. Uh, if I give a very uh, short overview of Korean cinema history, mm -hmm. uh, filmmaking began in Korea in early 20th century, like many other Asian nations. But uh, first uh, feature film 
they claim that was made in uh, Korea that was uh, in 1919. So like, you know, uh, more than 100 years uh, back from now. Mm -hmm. But we have to remember at that time, uh, Korea was under the occupation of Japan. Mm -hmm, yeah. Korea was uh, colonized by Japan from 1910 to 1945. And during that period, uh, Japan uh, as a colonizing nation uh, influenced them in a great way, of course. I mean, including c cinema culture, because Japan wanted to uh, make films in Korea in Japanese language even. Mm -hmm. So uh, after the World War II, we all know that immediately after World War II in 1950, uh, Korea went through the Korean War, you know, the yeah. war between North and South Korea that ended in 1954. And uh, eventually uh, Korean Peninsula got divided into North and South Korea. That's so, parallel. Right. Panel, yes. Uh, so uh, after that division, uh, of course, South Korea uh, started its own journey and North Korea a different journey. And of course, today we are talking about South Korean film industry. Yeah, and... yeah that is synonymous to Korea. <laughs> that I, uh, I should have... yeah. uh, maybe uh, this is good to identify for our uh, viewers that uh, we are talking about South Korean film industry specifically. And this South Korean film industry after 1954, the end of Korean War, or actually uh, there is no end, they call it a ceasefire. So Korean War may erupt again at any point. Mm -hmm. So this is like a long ceasefire that is going on. So uh, during this period in 1960s, 70s, of course, Korea went through a lot of uh, political and economic changes. And the modern Korea that we see now, uh, the South Korea, mm -hmm. the economic powerhouse of uh, Asia, that developed uh, during 1960s to 1980s, especially under the uh, rulership of President Park Chung-hee, who was a you know general, army general turned uh, president in South Korea, and was uh, uh, longest time he was uh, ruling South Korea, from 1961 to 1979. And the military dictatorship went on uh, from 1961 to 1988, right? Yes. Actually, uh, 1988, uh, even uh, you can uh, extend it to early 1990s. Okay. So, 1990s was actually the democratic period okay. that began in Korea. But uh, yes, uh, so, uh, after Park Chung He, even other you know uh, army generals they came to power, and until 1988, of course, you know they, they were ruling the country. Now, if we look at the uh, local film industry at that period in 1970s, 80s, uh, and early 90s, we will see that uh, they had their uh, local film industry uh, in a place called Chungmuro like, you know, uh, Dhaliwood or Taliwood, as we talk about Bengali cinema. Uh, it, it was like very much, you know, inward looking Korean language, local film industry based in Chungmura. And it was very, uh, you know, traditional genre kind of films, popular genre kind of films they were producing, like, you know, say melodrama, okay. very, you know, very um, touchy kind of melodrama films they were producing mostly except a few exceptions there were of course uh, a few important directors who were making uh, more independent films more you know uh, artistic expression kind of films but that was very rare at that time now but what is the time period here uh, i'm to we are talking about 1970s 80s the period okay, of okay. you know mm -hmm. popular genre films but now, uh, as you asked that, how this phase of new Korean cinema began, that began can actually... I, can I inter inter for a while uh, to, to make it sure that uh, until the uh, Second World War, Japan actually did not allow Korean people to make their own films, right? As I understand. Is it correct? Uh, it, no, it, it, it is... Uh, I, I would say there were uh, a mixed kind of filmmaking going on. Mm -hmm. Partly Japanese occupation, uh, they wanted to turn Korean culture, not only cinema, mm -hmm. towards like, you know, more Japanese oriented. For example, uh, Japan even wanted Koreans to learn Japanese language or even to bring 
say Japanese alphabet to Korea, as it happens, you know, in most uh, you know colonizing situations. So co Korean, what I was saying that Korean own local film industry was not properly developing mm. under the under the Japanese. And, and uh, you you were talking about uh, film uh, attempts in 1970s. Uh, I should mention Kim Ki Young in 1960s. He was also making some films, especially the classical film Housemaid uh, that was made in. So let's come come back to 1970s and 80s. Yes, uh, Housemaid is a very you know important Korean film, and uh, I think it was made in 1960, 60. 19, yeah, yeah. 1960 or 61 by Kim Ki Young. Kim Ki Young, yes. So we, we will come back to Housemaid again. Uh, I think I, I would like to talk about uh, contemporary Korean filmmakers and how Housemaid was actually remade by Thank another. You. Young, young Korean uh, filmmaker in 2009. So uh, I, I may mention that uh, a bit later. But to uh, wrap up on this part that, you know, how this new Korean cinema developed, we have to go back to the 1990s. 1990s was the period when, uh, especially early 1990s onwards, Korean uh, politics moved away or was able to move away from the clutches of army generals, from the army rulership. And to a like more you know uh, democratic environment and especially the president uh, we remember kim young sam who became korean president in uh, 1993 he, he uh, brought a policy called segihua which means open door policy so uh, korea until then was quite closed door you know uh, in various ways culturally economically politically of course but uh, kim young sam government uh, heralded a new phase, a new slogan, like, you know, Segi Hua, which means open door. So they opened door to the outer world in mm -hmm. every way. And uh, it, they took film and cultural media as like, you know, uh, a tool of uh, soft diplomacy, as a tool of soft power. Of course, many countries around the world, they speak about this, you know, soft power and cultural diplomacy through cinema. But I think uh, in the mid 1990s, Korean government of that time, they really proved that they were mm. serious about using cinema. They and, meant uh, it and they, they made it. it. They, they meant it and they uh, started uh, a good number of different organizations. For example, uh, you know, Korean Film Council, Korean Film Archive, mm -hmm. and uh, more importantly, film festivals like Busan Film Festival mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Jeonju Film Festival. All these began around 1995-96 at that period. Okay, and okay. Uh, my, my next question was, was supposed to be this, uh, this one, that is, what are the roles of the cinema institutions uh, yeah. in Korea to develop this new wave of Korean cinema? Uh, yeah. But before that, you can conclude this part. Uh, so I, I think mid 1990s was the period when we see this, you know, embryonic development of new Korean cinema mm -hmm. with the advent of uh, Busan Film Festival and with Kim Ki Do uh, coming uh, in the film scene. He made his first film, Crocodile, in 1996. Okay. So, uh, so that th that was the period, and I think uh, you know, talented filmmakers like Park Chan Wook. Bong Joon Ho, all of them actually uh, finished their overseas study. Mm -hmm. uh, I think both of them studied overseas and they returned to Korea sometime in late 1990s. Mm -hmm. So uh, th that was the time. And talking about institutional uh, parameters, as we were saying, that uh, Korean government initiated a good number of institutions. For example, COFIC, which works for you know uh, taking Korean cinema. Uh, outside Korea. So this is like a global arm of, you know, Korean film culture. So when we see, let's say, a seminar happening in France about Korean cinema, or a special exhibition of a Korean film happening in New York, possibly that is some kind of, you know, uh, uh, outreach work initiated by Korean Film Council. So Korean Film Council is very active and uh, still today, they are, you know, taking entrepreneurial role, uh, role to actually, you know, uh, take out uh, and exhibit Korean cinema worldwide. Similarly, Korean Film Archive 
is a very you know uh, efficient organization of course it is archiving korean films but again if you uh, if somebody goes to their website you will find that korean film archive already uh, i would say at least 50 or more korean films with english subtitles are available on youtube channel hosted by korean film archive i i maybe, I, maybe newly restored uh, newly restored many of them are newly restored but many of them are like you know korean classics that they are bringing up from early years and all this together uh, they are uh, they, they are prepared with english subtitles mm -hmm. for you know uh, overseas viewers who can access and watch and of course busan film festival uh, as we know that starting in 1996 it has become like you know uh, asia's most important film festival and uh, i have visited busan film festival a number of times and the korean government has actually established a cinema center which is like a huge kind of complex in busan mm. uh, you know, with a number of different uh, theaters there is a you know a film library there is a library of books and uh, periodicals there is seminar room there is cafe so this is like an you know ideal uh, you know large film center yeah. that they call it the cinema center and uh, year round there are different kind of programs but of course in the month of october it becomes the you know venue for uh, busan film festival i have so, seen uh, one list uh, busan is uh, in the in the in that list uh, top 10 international or global film festivals uh, mm -hmm. it was in on number 10 maybe okay yes but but i want to add that other than busan film festival they also started different you know regional film festivals like you know in jeonju which is another you know uh, lesser known korean town mm -hmm. uh, they started jeonju film festival particularly focusing on digital cinema I now I, i i think today we all speak about Uh, digital cinema but uh, they started it like you know uh, in late 1990s and they actually brought uh, talented filmmakers from around the world to produce films only in digital media in in the early 2000s onwards at that time so uh, and they have uh, numerous other smaller film festivals of course uh, happening uh, all over korea and most of them are uh, directly or indirectly supported by some kind of government institution so uh, the, this is important that i think um, the korean government uh, when they started segiwa and wanted to use film as a you know cultural arm to reach out to the outside world they uh, also brought in all kind of industry members all kind of stakeholders together mm -hmm. which, which does not happen in many of the asian countries and i i think they, that is why they could reach to a level of parasite you know the success of parasite is uh, quite you know uh, awe inspiring for us but it did not happen one day that one is what day. i it, it, it has gone through like you know last 20 years and yeah, reached... so other other film film uh, nations like say in south asia pakistan bangladesh they can follow this their their initiatives and steps they have taken and 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 as you said parasite didn't come in one day it, it is a, it, ha, it they have the long preparation history and culture so let's uh, talk about the masters of contemporary korean cinema we have already mentioned kim ki do park chanuk bong joon ho there might be some other masters too so let's hear from you uh, how do you see their works how do we appreciate uh, their works uh korean cinema culture has been developed uh, of course at one hand through you know genre films still there is genre films like you know war film and thriller films horror films or even you know uh, teenage romance films these are very popular kind of genre films that is going on uh, like you know last 25 years or so the period we are talking about but of course um, uh, we have to mention at least five or six important directors who has become like author directors and who has become you know uh, nationally and internationally well known i want to begin with im kon tech 
Imkon Tech is uh, a director from actually the 1980s. 1980s, even before that. Uh, he, he is very senior. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he is somebody who can be compared with Shatajit Ray in India. I see. So his films are very classical and, you know, speaking about Korean uh, cultural essence. Mm -hmm. For example, his film Sophianji is uh, about a uh, touring uh, singing group. You know, there are singing, there used to be singing groups uh, like ours in rural Bengal, in rural Korea, that uh, a group of singers will go from village to village and, uh, you know, sing Pansori, which is the um, classical uh, Korean music, the, you know, local folk music. So he followed that kind of a group. This is a fictional film and made in, I think, uh, 1989. So, uh, so, so, uh, this is one of his important films, but he, he made at least, you know, 10, 15 important films. But what I wanted to give an example that he always focused on uh, classic uh, symbols of Korean culture. So he brought up this, you know, singing group in his film. His uh, more, uh, another important film is Chun Yang, which won uh, uh, important awards, I think, in uh, Venice and Berlin in uh, and Cannes. I think I, he actually that is the first Korean film that won an award in uh, Cannes. Uh, it was made in it, 2000, as I know. In the year 2000, right? In the year 2000, and uh, again ab about you know going in the past era in, in like a period film, uh, you know, giving us a historical uh, story about uh, Korean uh, early history, that kind of period. So Imkon Tech is uh, one to be remembered. Uh, I would mention another one who is Lee Chang Dong. Mm. Lee Chang Dong, uh, almost uh, you know, in the same uh, periphery of Kim Ki Duk and uh, Park Chan Wook, but True. maybe a, a bit senior. But he he is, uh, I think, more politically inclined uh, Korean filmmaker from South Korea, and uh, his films dealt with Korean political history. So, for example, uh, his important film is Peppermint Candy, wh which uh, takes us actually back to the, you know, political struggle of uh, South Korea. Mm -hmm. Looking back to this, you know, uh, student uh, protest of uh, 1980, which is a very important watershed uh, moment. That Guangzhou in, massacre. Guangzhou massacre. So, he, he looks back to Guangzhou massacre of, you know, May 1980. Mm -hmm. uh, in peppermint candy and goes actually all the important epochs of Korean politics. Mm -hmm. So th this is an important film. He, his films, uh, some of his films, of course, been to international film festivals, but I think his films are more about Korea and inside Korea. He, he is probably better known. Both, I think, Im Kon Tech and uh, Lee Chang Dong, they are better known inside Korea than outside Korea. I see. But Burn, Burning is another film made by him. Burning right? is his more recent film, yes. Burning, I think, Mirror is another film he made. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so he has made a good number of important, you know, uh, films. But uh, if we look to Kim Ki Do, who is, of course, uh, has been a favorite among us, the uh, film buffs mm -hmm. uh, in Asia and other parts of the world. Uh, and uh, we all know his films are very dark, you know, in many ways. Yeah. He, he likes to bring out the dark chambers of uh, human existence in different ways. Mm -hmm. And sadly, sadly, he died uh, recently, I think during Corona pandemic. Yeah. Uh, he died uh, quite an, you know, in a quite an early age. Europe, somewhere in East Europe, he was in, in yeah. shooting or something like that, right? Yes. In Romania, I think uh, he died in Romania probably in 2021. So, uh, or maybe 2020, I did, uh, probably. So, uh, anyway, but uh, I think Kim Ki Duk will be remembered uh, for his very out of the box look and very uh, passionate, experimental, uh, too much artistic, but again, uh, some kind of monstrous use of visuals, yeah. you know, in his. He, he takes, uh, and uh, I should add that he he is probably better known in outside Korea yeah. than inside Korea. 
I, see. I found I found that many people inside Korea they don't like uh, Kim Ki Duk much. Partly because, uh, as we know, that he has been also termed as being anti-woman. Mm. His his projection of women's body and all this. This and also there's also... a there's a case uh, some some. Uh, former act this came forward with some allegations of, of yes. harassment or something like that. Yes. But, but despite all of this, uh, as we know that he is an uh, important Great filmmaker, yeah. Great filmmaker, there's no doubt about it. And of his films won actually all the important awards, all three major festivals. I mean, he's one of the filmmakers who got like, you know, best film award in Cannes, in Berlin and in Venice. For different all, all three great festivals yes, yes. so and uh, if i if i ask like among this uh, between these two films which one is your favorite is spring summer fall winter and spring and three i don't two different kind of films but i like both of these but which one yeah. you prefer oh i, I think same here but i <laughs> I, would, I would vote more for uh the four seasons i mean spring summer fall winter, okay and... okay okay but uh, I was puzzled and stunned by the story and narrative by Chi Iron. Yeah, it was really new. Yes. Yeah. And any other film like Karirang Keta and some other uh, mention? Fr from uh, The Eye in Time, the... Samaritan Girl, mm -hmm. many, many, many films. Yes. No, I, 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 I... I liked uh, Samaritan Girls too. I mean, this is quite a different look. As you know, that in East Asian culture, mm -hmm. including Japan, there is very you know extreme focus on uh, you know uh, school girls in popular culture. I mean, yeah. in man manga and in uh, other forms. So, but but uh, the the difficult life these cute you know uh, school girls are going through. That is, I think, we saw so vividly in Samaritan. Yeah, very dark story. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, but uh, talking about, uh, let's say, after Kim Ki Duk, or I mean, along with Kim Ki Duk, but of course, most well known two directors are Park Chan Wook and Bong Joon Ho. Yeah. Uh, before, uh, but I would like to bring out at least uh, two other directors mm -hmm. who are uh, quite you know, extraordinary, I think. One is uh, Hong Sang Su, okay. another one is uh, Im Sang Su. So I, uh, you mentioned uh, this, um, this 1960 film, uh, Housemaid. So Housemaid was actually remade by Im Sang Su. Okay. So Im, Im Sang Su is a new, you know, younger uh, generation uh, Korean filmmaker who is actually bringing like, you know, popular genre mm -hmm. into art filmmaking. So in in not, modern setting. In modern setting. So his films are like, you know, middle cinema. Not, okay. not very arty. If, if, if we look at Kim ki Duk films or even Im Kontek films, not that kind of arty. On the other hand, he wants to bring more generic elements. Like if you watch his, uh, you know, Housemaid, mm -hmm. it, it has been made more, uh, more visually presentable. The, mo the modern version, let's say, which is, uh, 2009 version but we should also talk about uh, Hong Sang Su mm -hmm. who is a uh, very different and very you know experimental kind of uh, Korean filmmaker he because of his filmmaking uh, he has been hailed by film critics quite you know uh, highly I would say uh, <laughs> in, including uh, Professor David Bordwell from US uh, Bordwell uh, brought him up as an example of uh, Asian minimalist filmmaking. You oh. know, uh, David Bordwell has a, you know, one of his important contribution to film theory is the idea of Asian minimalism. So okay. uh, the Hong Sang Su is uh, quite often, uh, you know, seen as an example of Asian minimalist filmmaking. Okay. And now if we look at his films, his films are uh, very much every day. In, in his films, nothing happens. You know, let, let, let's say 
one Korean journalist, a young man, he meets a French actress suddenly in a sea beach uh, in Korea and they meet up and we, we become eager. We think that they will fall in love. There will be like, you know, further development of a romantic story and all this, but actually nothing happens. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Just to give an example. Sounds so, like so, Simon Liang from Taiwan. Yeah, very much. Yes, yes. I think Simon Liang is uh, another example of Asian minimalism. Yeah. So uh, following that kind of filmmaking, uh, Hong Sang-soo has become uh, very important. His films has been, of course, you know, he had retrospectives in France, in uh, New York. Actually, I, I think the Museum of Modern Image. I Mommy, see. They, held his uh, retrospective but he, he is not like a you know of course he is not a genre filmmaker he, he breaks all kind he goes away from all kind of genre and he is also not very film festival favorite i mean his films of course has been shown in many film festivals but i mean uh, unlike kim ki duk or park chenuk bong jun ho he is uh, not like a you know uh, big award winner film festival uh, filmmaker from korea but his films are very intimate and very, I mean, you, one has to um, look very closely, you know, uh, like Sai Ming Liang films that, you know, when I say that nothing happens, but of course, uh, many things are happening in a very subtle way. Yeah. So he, his films are very subtle in that way. So I, I, I would like to encourage uh, our viewers here to look for uh, Hong Sang Su films. No, I, to, from today's conversation, I also became aware of this filmmaker. Uh, thanks for that. And I love, of course, I'll explore his films. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, now I think uh, going back to, of course, two big well-known uh, Park chan and uh, Bong Joon-ho. Mm -hmm. Park chan came to Korean film, uh, filmmaking. Um, I mean, he came to know to be known uh, in a large way because of his film JSA, Joint Security. Joint Security, yeah. yeah. 2000. Made in 2000. Made in 2000. That b brought him, you know, big fame. And especially uh, because of his uh, imagination of, you know, bringing together North and South Korea. Mm -hmm. People who have seen this film, of course, you will remember that how, uh, you know, he... In an at least at an imaginary level, mm. he brings us uh, the possibility of uh, bringing together North and South Korea. And uh, after that, he has of course made uh, his uh, trilogy. That is, you know, the Vengeance trilogy. The Vengeance trilogy. Vengeance trilogy, which is again uh, some kind of dark tales, but uh, he became very famous for his Old Boy. Old Boy, which was remade in Hollywood, uh, and people say. Uh, it was made by Spike Lee, but it is a very inferior in comparison to uh, Old uh, Boy. Original Old Boy, which is, I think, a 2003 film. And then he went on making, I think, Stalker, right? Uh, the uh, ho ho Hollywood film. Both, actually, Park chan and Bong Joon-ho, mm -hmm. they went on making films in Hollywood, in mainstream Hollywood, you know, films like Stalker or Snowpiercer by uh, Bong Joon-ho in 2014. Stoker was been, made in 2013. Uh, Stoker in 13. Snowpiercer. Snowpiercer by Bong Joon Ho. It was made in 2013, in the same year. Mm -hmm. So, what we see that in last 10 years, yeah. they have been also accommodated in uh, mainstream Hollywood uh, you know, film production culture. Yeah. Who, which is, of course, you know, again, uh, rare for other Asian filmmakers. Right. It, it, which was possible for two important Korean filmmakers. I mean, both Bong Joon-ho. Now and... about Bong Joon-ho. Mm -hmm. Bong Joon-ho, uh, the, the, uh, do you remember that? Uh, Memories of film? Murder? Uh, Memories of Murder. No, I, I remember the uh, monstrous horror. Uh, who, who oh, I see. The host. The host, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I use that a lot uh, with my students. I mean, in my classes, I use this one. The host is, um, of course, apparently this is a film about this monster that, you know, like, you know. But it's, it's not limited to genre film, right? Right. 
more political and yeah yeah that is what i mean you know uh, we all know that south korea has been under the political uh, clout of uh, usa and uh, this american influence is palpable in contemporary korean culture mm -hmm. in any in many ways you know and korean politics korean economy uh, they are so much i i, I remember uh, um, the film the coast guard by kim ki duk uh, it, it was portraying the same same kind anything. of uh, yeah yeah american influence yes so i, I think american influence has become a very uh, you know two edged sword double edged sword both for south korea and japan i think you know at one hand uh, both south korea and japan they could develop and flourish as like you know global economy because of their relationship and you know interconnection with uh, america hmm. but on the other hand uh, they had to pay the price you know you know what i mean that yeah they, socially politically uh, and also economically they, they are paying the price to the big power like america Yeah. So uh, the host, in some way, uh, remembering uh, that kind of influence, you know, and the the good question is who is the host here? Yeah, you know? yeah. The Koreans are host, or the uh, Americans are the host. So or who uh, is the monster in in that? Even film. who is the monster? Yes, exactly. So uh, there is a very, uh, I mean, but of course, I I would say probably majority of people around the world when they watch the host. they watch it as a like a genre film yeah like a monster horror film you know but uh, at least part of them probably think about or rethink about the film later especially the first the first scene uh, where, where in the lab where is a white american scientist uh, as a character it starts from there right mm -hmm. yes 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 so uh, but from the days of the host of course uh, bong joon ho has gone to you know Uh, a much higher level with his parasite and as we have seen in parasite that he talks about this you know uh, social contrast present in uh, apparently successful korean society you know i, I mean south korea is seen as a very uh, affluent uh, example among the asian societies but uh, the deep uh, you know invisible contrast that is within the society that we can very severely feel you know in a film like uh, parasite and uh, how uh, i would say uh, how economically how you know how subtly uh, a director like uh, bong joon ho brought this aspect on screen yeah and that, and that house has become the symbol of the korean uh, class society the structure of the korean class society right yes you know yeah uh, so we have discussed about all uh, masters of korean cinema uh, there are so many other directors too uh, and there is some say genre film like train to busan and uh, some other very popular film like my sassy girl romantic comedy right yes uh, films like she is there oasis is there by lee ching lee chang dong so we have and and a, a tale of two sisters he's also considered a master right kim ji won a tale of two yes. sisters he he is more like a master of genre filmmaking i think yeah okay uh let's talk about now uh how does they especially the south korean directors cover or portray other asians especially i'm uh, i'm very interested to know about how they portray north korean people uh could you please shed some light on that uh th that's a, of course very tricky issue and uh, i think they cannot portray north korea uh, or north koreans in a direct way what uh, I, i have seen that uh, in some films they portray uh, if i talk about other asians you know many asian people like you know people from china people from india or bangladesh nepal indonesia they, they are going to south korea to work as migrant worker so this you know migrant workers lives have been portrayed 
in different ways in different films and of course we can remember a film like bandhobi mm -hmm. we, we, i have seen it gunfriend yes and uh, that shows uh, the relationship of a bangladeshi migrant worker a man with a korean girl mm -hmm. and how they become you know romantically you know close and all this so uh, the, i think this kind of films uh, i have seen this kind of film in filipino context i mean korean filipino context also they have made a uh, film like bandhobi but uh, uh, I, I think about North Korea, there is some films which are made in a in imaginative way. I mentioned like JSA. I remember another film called uh, Pung San. Pung San is produced by Kim Ki Do, but directed by one of the assistant directors of Kim Ki Do. And Pung San means actually a dog which can fly. This is like a you know mythical character. And uh, in in this film, uh, th there is a you know uh, something like a dog bird, wh which can actually easily fly in between you know North and South Korea. So the, uh, of course you know this target parallel, wh which uh, now they call DMZ, uh, demilitarized zone. Okay. This, uh, but in practice, actually it is probably the most highly militarized zone in the world. You know, no, nobody can actually cross mm -hmm. you know, from North Korean side to South Korea or vice versa. And uh, that is why a film like Pung San, they show that they imagine, let's say, a, a, that uh, th there is a you know mythical creature that can easily cross this border. But in practice, they cannot. Now, what is happening that uh, many, uh, not many, but I think some North Koreans, they go through China and come to South Korea for asylum. And also, uh, also they live in the border of you know, China and North Korea. So, I mean, after going to, uh, who, who, where life is very difficult also, you know, this is very, uh, you know, very cold, very unlivable condition. So uh, I, I found that there is a uh, filmmaker, Zhang Lu, mm -hmm. who is a uh, Korean Chinese himself. He moved to uh, South Korea, and he is actually portraying uh, this kind of, you know, struggle of uh, Chinese and North Korean uh, migration to South Korea. Mm -hmm. So, if we follow his films, uh, he, he is, of course, I mean, he is well known, but probably not as well known as other important directors we mentioned. But he is very important because of his work about this marginal community in. South Korea. Okay. He, he mostly focuses on, you know, life in the border of Korea and China. Like, you know, he, he, one of his films, I remember, Dumen River. Dumen River is the river, uh, you know, in the border region of uh, Korea and China. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so he, he portrays uh, th this kind of, you know, uh, Korean and uh, Chinese migrant life. So, uh, th this has been, uh, of course, uh, Korean population is majority Korean. I mean, like, you know, more than 90% are, of course, uh, Korean. And in that way, this is a uh, homogeneous monolithic culture, largely homogeneous. Mm -hmm. But of course, there are many different kind of segments and not, uh, of course, there is economic segmentation and also ethnic segmentation. Okay, okay. But, but these segmentations are not always present in uh, mainstream, popular, or even art cinema. But a filmmaker like Zhang Lu, I think, is bringing that kind of, you know, segmentations on this. I have one observation. When South Korean directors are portraying North Korean characters, uh, uh, in most cases, I see them, they portray them as brothers and uh, not as uh, enemy people. Uh, uh -huh. There's a brotherly approach to them. Uh, uh, do you agree that? Uh, yes, I, I, I do agree because uh, I think I have also followed this kind of pattern that uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that but, is also the tone actually in uh, JSA. Joint yeah, Korean. in JSA. Yeah. They're playing together. They're yeah, mixing and they are actually loving each other, right? Yes. Yeah. 
So we are at the end of our conversation, but I have one more question, uh, especially I uh, want to know from you that what is happening in post-parasite scenario of South Korean cinema? Uh, can you please tell us about that? I think uh, Parasite gave like a, you know, a new momentum mm -hmm. to Korean uh, art filmmaking. And of course, I mean, as you mentioned that uh, not only institutions like Kofik and the Korean Film Archive, there has been a huge kind of uh, development in uh, educating about cinema okay. to the young. You know, many like, for example, as uh, I, I was a visiting professor in Korean National University of Arts back in 2014. I have seen that, you know, they are film department. They have two film departments. One is like, you know, filmmaking department. Mm -hmm. Where actually Lee Chang Dong is a professor, and they have a film studies department where people like us, you know, they uh, study cinema. So uh, in the same university, they have two different departments devoted to film, and uh, and similar kind of you know uh, filmmaking and film studies departments have been built up and developed all over Korea, and th that is what uh, another aspect we have to remember that. Uh, Korean cinema became global uh, mm. over the years through the hard work of many different people, including, let's say, uh, film professors in Korean institutions. Mm. So to talk about uh, post-parasite scenario, I think um, we have to look for more younger Korean filmmakers because man many of these uh, young uh, you know, filmmakers are now studying in different universities inside Korea. Mm -hmm. If I give a two, two very quick example, one is uh, again talking about Korean National University of Arts where I was situated. Uh, we had an uh, Indonesian uh, young student named Mokbul Mubarak. Yeah. And this year Mokbul Mubarak completed, he is an Indonesian and he is now gone back to Indonesia. But this year he made his debut feature film called Autobiography. And okay. autobiography has made headlines around the world. If you, if uh, is it a uh, is it an Indonesian production or Korean production? This is an Indonesian, uh, but co-production. It is co-produced by uh, I don't remember if it is Korea, but there is a number of different countries that came together, which means that he has gone to different uh, platforms in different international film festivals, and you know was able to. Uh, get funding for his film but of course but he did his masters in film from this korean national university of we, we, uh, in bangladesh we have these two directors abu shahid imon and noha shuman yes. who studied uh, cinema production in in korea right yes abu shahid imon actually studied in the same department in where i was based in in uh, korean national university of arts like mokbul mubarak actually they are there i think like alum um, they're alumni yeah so this is a good example that how these new directors are coming up. And I want to just as a last bit, I want to mention Kim Bora. Kim Bora is another young Korean, uh, young female director mm -hmm. who has uh, made uh, some excellent short films. But uh, her, uh, I think, uh, feature film, The Tale of Hummingbird is coming up. Or maybe al already it, is, it, it has been released, but we, we have not been able to watch it. Mm -hmm. She also, like uh, Park chan or Bong joon ho she was also educated in USA. Okay. Many of the Korean directors have been actually educated in USA, in filmmaking and, you know, in media training. So Kim Bora is uh, a new young filmmaker. But I, I just want to mention that people like Kim Bora are coming. And, you know, they, there will be probably more uh, exciting uh, films from Korea to be seen in coming years. So, uh, the Co Korean national sorry. cinema is not stopping very shortly. They will continue producing great films and producing great uh, filmmakers. That 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 uh, message we can take take from this conversation, right? Yes, yes, very much. Uh, any concluding remarks? No, I, I think uh, I would like to encourage because uh, both of us here are from South Asia and we have been, you know, uh, thinking about the development of cinema in South Asia, especially in Bangladesh, but also in South Asian context. 
uh, I think we have a takeaway for South Asia and also probably other parts of Asia that how uh, film culture can be used truly as you know a tool of cultural diplomacy. Yeah. For example, Korea is a you know South Korea is like a tiny nation. This is like you know fifty one million people, which is you know less than one percent of uh, world population. Hmm. But it is already ninth major economy of the world, and fourth major economy of Asia. Hmm. So, which means that, and we all know, we are today here talking about you know various aspects of South Korean cinema in last twenty years. So this means that uh, many smaller nations, if they feel smaller economically or population wise or in other way, they have also a, a lot to do. And especially in terms of cinema culture, cinema can be used uh, as an expression of a national identity, yeah. which, which South Korea has shown us very truly. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Zakirjasen Raju uh, to join with us with me and I actually learned uh, many things from this conversation. Thank you so much, Professor Fahmid, for inviting me and for this wonderful conversation.